Hi hey guys, Natalie here, all for United, and with Rich Lafferty. Rich uh, is on our show all the time. It's going to be a great show. I'm excited. It's all about Mark Skinner tonight. Um, your comfy chair's already there, Rich. So uh, <laughs> my podcast chair. Podcast chair. Okay. Um, jump in the comments, guys. Say what you've got to say. You know, nothing's off limits tonight. Uh, it's all about Mark Skinner and what we think about him. Rich, I want to know from you, when you first met Mark, what you thought, um, just generally sort of how you first got introduced to him. Go for it. Uh, I can't remember when I first met him. <laughs> Excuse me. When I first became aware of him was obviously when he became the Birmingham manager um, at the end of, end of 2016 start of 2017 um when david parker and, and marcus big not obviously marcus who was at aston villa at the end of last season they left mark i think at the time had been working in the academy or with the development squad or something like he'd, he'd been involved with the club um and he came in as as the first team manager and it was interesting because i mean birmingham for so long had been a really good team like you know they'd been one of the leaders they would had good players they were challenging at the top of the league you know they won the FA Cup under David and Marcus and it was a massive change and it was a surprise at the time as well I remember it and you know Mark had big shoes to fill similar to to now in a way and um, it was a slow start from what I remember so when he came in he had the spring series which was basically a little filler where everyone played each other once um, as we were transitioning from the old winter season, which ended in November, to the new summer season, which started the following August. So we had a little, just small series. I think a lot of teams treated them as friendlies almost, to be honest. And that was probably a good opportunity for him to to start working on his squad. And then the transfer window opened, obviously, in the summer. And it took a little bit. So they got to the FA Cup final during that spring series, which was you know, a very good achievement for him in his first few months. I think they beat... They definitely beat Arsenal and I think they beat Chelsea on penalties in the semi-finals. Um, and in the league, it took a little bit of time. Like, you know, he had a very different style of play. He's very possession-based, whereas Max and David, it wasn't always. It was quite route one, get the ball forward, you know. Not physical, but it was sort of defence first, whereas Mark wanted to be on the ball and, you know, for a team that wasn't always used to that, it took a little bit of time. And, and after that, I mean, for what he had, and look, there's some good players. Don't get me wrong. Mm. That Birmingham team, you know, they had Ellen White, who was massive for them. You know, they had players like Jess Carter and Rachel Williams and internationals as well. You know, Andrina Hegerberg was there for a little bit. Ada's sister, um, Lucy Staniforth, obviously, Ethan Mannion, Keris Harrop. You know, they had a really good team. And Katrin Berger came in from PSG. and But they were just, they were always so tough to beat. You know, I remember there was a spell, I think it was towards the end of his first season they beat Man City I think it was 2-0 Liverpool 4-0 Arsenal 3-0 and, and they were they were battering these teams you know and they were keeping clean sheets and I just remember they were just tough they were tough to beat that, that's the one thing I remember they played good football they were based around Ellen White you know there's no doubt about that she's got I think the Arsenal game when they won 3-0 I think she's got a hat trick and I think the Man City game they won 2-0 she scored both of them as well um she was massive for them but he just made them into a a good team um and yeah you know I got to know him well I was obviously this is before I joined Sheffield United and ironically when I joined Sheffield United um our first game or sorry second game I think was actually against his Birmingham team in the Conti Cup um so I spoke to him a lot at that game and I just saw him around a lot you know spoke to him a lot did some interviews obviously you saw the interview I did the profile um when he went to Orlando and uh yeah you know obviously there's all this discussion I'm sure we'll come on to it now between his time at Birmingham and his time in mm -hmm. Orlando and I think there's so many reasons you, you the two things are different and it's not to excuse the Orlando and I'm, like I said I'm sure we'll talk about it but I think when a manager's coming into the WSL it's better to judge them on their time in the WSL and not mm -hmm. the time you know if he was going to another NWSL team I probably have some more questions because you know he has struggled to adapt over there and to their way of playing but i think coming back to the wsl 
I, I, as if I was a Man United fan, I, you know, it will take time. You know, whenever a new manager comes in, things change. You know, players change, mm. styles change. But I think he's got real potential to get it right. I really do. So, I, like I said, it's all the questions, all the answers. So, a lot of questions I've been seeing, and I know Karen's in there, and Stuart, and John. And listen, guys, I'm not going to miss your questions, but a lot of questions, a lot of people are saying, it's all right, you know, back then, uh, this and that, Chelsea beating Chelsea, beating City, beating Liverpool. The money wasn't there that, 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 that it was now, you know. I think we can all agree there's loads more money. And I'd say there's probably a lot more better players, like all the top players now play, not all of them, but, you know, Sam Kerr, Pernell Harder, Bunny Shaw, Miedema, um, you know, and if I'm thinking of top strikers, maybe I'd put Toto in there from PSG. But other than that, you know, they're in England and then most of them are at Chelsea now. So, you know, do you not think that he's been out of it so long and it's changed and then he's coming back in two, two, two three years down the line, how it's there's so much more money, there's so much more talent? Yeah, to an, I mean, it's changed, don't get me wrong. It's definitely changed in the last few years, but I think the, some of the personnel has changed, but that's natural, you know, over the, the course of three or four years. But, style of the league has changed. I don't think, you know, necessarily the way, you know, Chelsea have always played that way under Emma Hayes. You know, Emma Hayes has been there for so long now and Emma Hayes was here um, when Mark, Mark was here. You know, Mark, they've never changed massively. You know that, you know, with the British players, the English players, their style of play. And I think when Mark would have been here and, and when they did beat Manchester City, I think, you know, Ellie Roebuck and Jill Scott and Steph Horton and Stanley and Paris and players like that were were all part of that team. And, and I mean, the Arsenal team, I'm trying to think if Miedema was here, I think she would have been here maybe the second season, but they had Kim Little, you know, Van der Donk, Jordan Norris, Beth Mead, you know, that team, that attack's not changed a huge amount. So, oh, it's got better, don't get me wrong. And, you know, I think a good example is look at how Birmingham went was after he left, you know, even before... Um, obviously, Wardy went there last year when, when Marta Tejedor came in to replace him. And it was a very left-field replacement at the time. You know, they went really downhill. Like, they really massively struggled. And you, you're right, you know, time does change. But, I mean, it's not like he's been gone 10 years. You know, it's only been since 2019 um, when he left. It's just over two years. So, um, yeah, look, players change. And coming back now, it's tough. Because Chelsea are very, very good. Like you say, Man City have just signed Bunny and uh, Vicky Lasada. But, yeah, he's got a good foundation. And, you know, Man United, they've got a good team. You know, we were talking about this the other day when you came to watch Chef. And, you know, the first 11 particularly, there's some very good players in there now. And some players he knows as well. Obviously, Aoife, who, you know, he always used to rave about. Um, he knows Lucy Staniforth, obviously, as well. Whether she'll be regularly in the starting 11, I'm not sure. I'm sure Aoife will. Um, but yeah, more expectation, definitely, you know, compared to Birmingham. Oh, wow. But yeah, I mean, he had Birmingham, I think when he left, I'd have to check my memory on it, but I think they were fourth, fourth or very close yeah. to that top three. And obviously you look at where Birmingham are now, um, they've regressed a lot since then. Um, and obviously there's other factors as well. But all I can say is, you know, at Birmingham, I saw a coach get the best out of, what he had, and what he had was good, but it was nowhere near as good as the, the three above. Um, and I think that's all you can ask for. You know, if a coach can get the best out of what he's got, then, you know, then it's on the club, you know, the club to back it. And over the next few years, you know, Man United, again, we've discussed this so much now, they have the potential to do whatever, whatever they want, whatever they want to do. And, you know, you can, you can get the coach, you know, and I think Mark's a very good coach, but, you know, the club have to do their bit as well. Um, be interesting to see now whether, you know, they allow him to sign maybe some of his own players because I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the ones that have been signed so far were cases. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting. Karen is in the comments. I'm sure she's watching. I told her she would come back to it. But what do you think <coughs> the biggest challenge will be for Mark at Man United? I think... <sighs> There's a few things. I mean, the expectation, definitely. You know, they've got 
I mean, I say they've got a tough start. All the teams have got a tough start because it's a tough league. You know, you look at every game now and obviously City, Arsenal, Chelsea are always difficult. You know, Reading's difficult. Brighton now is a difficult team to play against. You know, Leicester have signed a lot of players. You know, Villa are signing players. So, you know, you've got to hit the ground running. I think, obviously, the three Champions League place thing always keeps you in with a shout. Whereas before, you know, even the third place team, if they lost touch, you'd had it. So... I think it'll be really interesting to see how it starts. I hope the fans give him time. Um, Personally, I think there's every chance they could hit the ground running because he's coming back into a league he knows. You know, when he started with Birmingham, he'd never managed in the league before. He'd never been a first-team manager before, whereas now, obviously, he has. He's got that experience. He knows this league. You know, the players know this league. Some of the players know him. Um, And I don't think his style is massively different to Casey, you know, from whenever I watched United with Casey, they wanted to be on the ball, you know, they wanted to get on the ball and pass it around. And that was Mark, you know, and I think at Birmingham, that was the difference. He was taking a team that probably wasn't used to doing that. And then obviously in Orlando, I mean, it's, it's become a cliche in a way, but it is a very, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, well, I'll leave it then. If you want to talk about it later on, I'll leave, I'll leave it and come back. But I think, yeah, I do think the main thing will be the the expectation. Yeah, um, I think as just, well. It's just something he's got to, you know, he's, he's been over in America now where, you know, they're wild about everything over there and every little result, you know, whichever team you are. So I think you've probably had a bit of a taste of it now. This, it's going to be wilder though. That's what I tell. Um, <laughs> because we don't... There's people that I'm just seeing already booting off about nothing. <laughs> and I'm just sort of like, okay, let's go. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I know that Birmingham, uh, you know, Chris and Craig, if he's in, you know, they've been telling me bits and they're sort of saying he needs time, he needs time. That's what a lot of the things that they've said. And, I mean, I'll come on to another point as well, but they said there was a time, 17, 18, four defeats in six games at the start of that season. I don't know how well you remember it, Rich. But if he came to United like that, for example, we got Reading. But I think, you know, I think that from the videos that we've seen of the new players, we're coming to get Champions League. This club deserves it. This, the, the. So that's what everyone's saying. So for me, I think they shouldn't be saying that because I think then it's setting expectations. But it's good to have those expectations. Don't get me wrong. But I do think that potentially we could be fourth. I know I've done a table and I've said we're going to be third. Obviously, I'm going to say that, but I just think with the un, you know, with what happened, she's left and now he's coming in. So it's likely to be some maybe, you know, getting bedding in. But I think we've had got a good start. I know you sort of said it's it's difficult. It is difficult, but, you know, I'd rather have the start that we've had now than have Arsenal and City, like what we had a couple of years ago, or had Chelsea and this. So I'm, I'm happy with the start. For me, I think he should be at least winning. Least minimum, 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 bare minimum nine points, but I'm expecting a bit more. Um, that's from the first five games. But if he came in the first five games, I can tell you now, Rich, first five games and lost them all, then people would be calling for his head. And you could, I get where you know you have to back a manager, but people would be saying this guy isn't good enough, and they said it from the start, and they're saying it again, so you know. Talk to me about that first start with Birmingham, what you know, and then what you know of United fans, that they will be, you know, we want to be winning. It's it's this badge. This is what we, we, we've been promised. And like you said, it's the club. But the club have now appointed this guy and, you know, this is what we want in, in a way. And it's, and it's right, in my opinion, that fans should ask for the best. Yeah, I think... There's three things in there, really. I think the, the start with Birmingham was interesting because I think they played Arsenal on the opening day and I think they lost in like the, I think it was a 90th minute penalty or something because I remember watching it. Um, I think it was 2-2 and then I think it was actually maybe Aoife who gave a penalty away. I might be wrong. Um, and then I think their next one was Manchester City because it was a game I was actually at. And they were 1-0 up for a long time. And it was actually one all going into stoppage time. And Man City scored twice in stoppage time. There was about eight minutes added on. Um, so they were like, they weren't, you know, like minnow defeats. They lost away to Arsenal in the 90th minute. They lost away to Man City. 
in the 90th minute. And then I think the fourth one, I think it was Sunderland. I think they got batters um, because it was one he referenced in the interview that I did with him, which was a big turning point in terms of the, he got the preparation wrong, he got the tactics wrong and he sort of set his ego aside after that is what he said to me and put the team first and I think they won six or seven of the next eight games or something like that um, after it. So I think the start was a little bit, I mean, it was his first full season and like, yeah, I think two of them, like I said, were in the last minute to Arsenal and Man City. Um, in terms of this season, I agree. I think three wins is probably the minimum. And then obviously you've got the tougher ones in there against Chelsea and Man City, which can always go either way. Whoever your manager is, you know, Chelsea are one of the best teams anywhere in the world now. Um, Man it's really tough, but you you know, they should be beating Reading. They should be beating uh, Leicester. So I think as well, like it's it's so difficult because you you said about Champions League, and I think there's five teams realistically, and I, I do think I don't think Everton will get it, but I do think they should be closer to challenging. I think that should be their expectation. I think it's a failure if they're not closer, having signed you know now absolute established internationals like Natalie Bjorn and. Anna Ombergaard, Tony Duggan, Aurora Gali, Kenza Daly, you know, they should be. You know, it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's so it's Everton, you know, they're not usually there. If you've got the players, you should be challenging. Um, so I think there's conceivably five teams. You would absolutely expect Chelsea to be in there. You'd absolutely expect Man City to be in there. I always expect Arsenal to be there because they just always have been. Obviously, they've got Miedemar and you know, Kim Little and Jordan Nobbs and Leah Volte and, you know, it's just signed Frieda Maynham. And that's the thing now, you know, in the WSL, you've no guarantee. You know, you can oh. be as good as you are. You know, Man United were top of the league for so long. They've got good players. They've got international players. They've got some really talented young British players and they ended up outside the top three. And that's just sometimes because the, the top three are so good. Um so it'd be really interesting because a lot of fans want Champions League and I completely get that. Like that's the pinnacle and and that is where you want to be. But I think there's five teams there now where you don't actually have a guarantee of it. You know, you can try your best and try your best and you know, that is where the coaching comes in. You know, that's where the best coaches and that's where you'll see either way where the mark is is ready for something like that. And not to criticize Casey, because I think Casey is a very good coach and I think I think I said this one of the other times I was on. If it had flipped, the season would have probably looked better. You know, if you'd started the season fourth, fifth, and then ended up, you know, in the Champions League, it would have been great. And because you started the season so well, you know, probably, I'm sure even United fans would admit above expectations to be top of the league and unbeaten for as long as they were. So obviously, drop off felt so disappointing. And obviously, there was the results against, you know, Reading and Brighton and whatnot. So. I think United were where probably most expected them to be last year. Still fourth, but a lot closer. But I think actually it felt worse because they were top. You know, no, but I don't think anybody expected that. I didn't. I'll admit that. I never expected United to be near the top of the league in their second season. Um, so it's weird. It's a strange paradox. And you know, Champions League wise, it'll be close this year. Um, but he needs I think, to hit the ground running. He does. Yeah, yeah, it. he does. I think with the United thing and no one expected us, yeah, but I think once they signed the Tobin and Kristen, like they did, I expected Champions League, pure bare minimum. And she, she came out and said it was a failure. And in a way, yeah, if you'd done it the other way around, yeah, you could say it wasn't bought the way it ended. I even said it after we lost to Chelsea. I said, if we then now screw up Champions League, it's a failure. That's it. You can't go from first to fourth and say it was a good season. And, she did say it was a failure and that's it. And then it's all come out, blah, blah, blah. But it is what it is. That's gone. That's in the past. I just want to say to Craig here, okay, mate. Yeah, it doesn't sound as bad, but it was your fans that told me this. So that's why I brought it up. The only other thing that I can see your fans and hi, Blessing and uh, Mickey, I don't know what he means. He needs to do something. Maybe he means signing strikers, but we'll get onto that as well. Because uh, I see Stuart here saying this and I'll get onto this. Um. 
the only other thing that again Birmingham fans have told me <laughs> uh, are that he was very he's got his favourite players. So he said Efe, he said Lad, um, Stanny. I don't know who else he's gonna like. Probably like Millie because I, th- I heard rumours that he was trying to sign her uh, before she came to United. So you know, um, if you know those players, yeah. But we've got Jackie there. We've got Risa there. So I, I can tell you now, Rich, this isn't me, but United fans will be upset if Risa, Jackie don't play and if he just sticks to Lad, Stanny, whoever, yeah? So apparently there's not much flexibility there with in the past with Birmingham teams uh, and he's stuck to the players that he likes. What would you say to fans that who want to see someone who mixes up? Because I think that was a criticism of Casey. She had her players and that was it. And, she, you know, obviously managers are always going to have the favourites, but... If it's not working, you need to mix it up. You know what I mean? Mm, I think there's a really, I think there's a really fine balance with it because you have a team like Chelsea, but obviously they've got all the riches in the world. You know they can change their team. You know I looked at their team in the Arsenal friendly the other day, and obviously Frank Kirby was missing, Sam Kerr was missing, and they still had an attack that had Penile Harder, Beth England, Guru Wright, and Erin Cuthbert. And it was like, wow, like, you know, when you've got those sort of embarrassment of riches, you can rotate as much as you want. And then I think back to sort of some of the Man City teams that I've watched over the years and they never rotated. You know, there was such a long, long period where they never rotated and it kind of worked for them, that consistency. So there's a balance in it. I think it's a different situation to Birmingham. I think at Birmingham, probably didn't have the depth and I'd have to, like off the top of my head, go back and look at what his subs benches were. But I think, you know, the reason Aoife Mannion and Lucy Staniforth and Hayley Ladd, etc., Ellen White were mainstays in his team were because they were the key players. You know, they were the best Birmingham had at that time and they were, you know, the linchpins of that team. And I think you look at United, Hayley, I think certainly has been the last couple of years, but, you know, you'd probably put Millie Turner in that. You'd probably put, you know, Ona Badger in that now and Jackie in that. So, you know, players like that, they're going to play every game. Like, I'd be really, you know, if they're fit and they're ready, I'd be surprised if they didn't, like whoever the manager is. I always feel like when you watch teams, I always feel like the attack is the one where you get rotated. I always think you want your back four, you know, never rotate your back four unless you have to. You know, if your back four is going to be, again, we were talking about this the other day, but probably Hannah, Aoife, Millie and Ona, you want to play that every single week. You want the same goalkeeper, you want the same back four. You probably want the same defensive midfield, whether that's Hayley and Vilder or, you know, just Hayley, Vilder, Jackie in some kind of three. I always think it's the attack that changes a little bit more. So I don't think it's about having favourites necessarily. He will have more depth to play with at Man United, I would assume. Um, but you want, it's, a real, it's a difficult balance because I, I, I always think you want I mean, like, I speak from experience at Sheffield United. The last 11 games, last season, League and Cup, we never changed the team. It was the exact same start in 11, 11 games in a row. And it wasn't because Neil Redfern had favourites. It was working. You know, and when it works, you don't change it. I think if United start the season and things go wrong, you need to see that flexibility. You need to see the changes. If they start the season well and they get the three wins you're talking about and they even maybe pick up a result against Chelsea or Man City, you're not going to change it. You're not going to say, okay, well, so-and-so is playing really well, but I'm going to change it just for the sake of it. You're going to stick with with what you've got. And I think with United, others may disagree. I look at the United team and for me, I see a a starting 11 in there that I think that's, that's your starting 11 if everyone's fit with a bit of depth. And, you know, players are going to get injured and certain games you're going to need different tactics. You're going to need different players for different roles. But I don't think it's always a bad thing to have a consistent starting eleven because they're the well-drilled ones. They're the ones that are going to know each other inside out. They're the ones that are going to get the results. You know, they're the ones that are going to scrape it out. But it's a balance. Like I said, there has to be the flexibility. But I don't think it's a case of having favourites. I just think it's a case of making a team work. You know, a man, you know, United last year, through injuries more than anything, you know, they lost a lot of players, you know, in Russo and Heath and, you know, Press was in and out. And there were others that got injured and 
you have to change your team, you know, and sometimes that unsettles things. You know, I think if you went back and looked at, off the top of my head, United's team the first four or five months when they were top of the league, I bet there weren't a huge amount of changes from week to week. And that's that's what works. So I, I don't think it's about having favourites. I'm sure some managers do have favourites, you know, in terms of players they can depend upon. But the ones that play week in, week out, by and large, most of the time, are there because they're your best players. And I think, you know, players like Jackie, players like Vilda, players like Aoife, Haley, you know, Alessia this season, they'll play every week, not because they're the favourites, but they'll play every week because they're the best players to play. And I, I just, that's how I view it. I, I get people think about favourites and whatnot, but I think you've got to, like I said, the balance. You've got to have the consistent team, but you've got to have the the flexibility to change it if you need to. But I don't think it's about favourites, so to speak. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, no, no. Got Blessing here saying, can you name that starting? I agree with you back, with your back five. If you say Mary starts and then you've got Honour, Hannah, Millie, uh, Mannion, I'd say yes, Lad Ladinator as the CDM. But then sometimes I think, with case, I think sometimes you don't even need a CDM. And I don't want to take it, uh, uh, anyone to be upset, but, you know, potentially against, you know, Reading. I'm not sure about Reading. Maybe you do, but Birmingham, you know, if you play sort of the lower level teams, I just want to see us going for it. So I'd maybe play Ladinator when you need it and then, um, you know, but then other times have Jackie, Bo Risa and Tooney as the thing. And then other times you'd have, this is my opinion now, guys, I'd have Lad. Jackie Orbo Risa and then Tooney and then I think the front three because it's all we've sort of got and I'll come on to a question is Leah Hansen Russo after that though Leah Hansen Russo I mean do you agree with that team Rich or would you change it anywhere when I've just said I think again it's where the flexibility comes in I agree in some games if you're playing if you're playing Birmingham if you're playing Aston Villa if you're playing West Ham I don't think you need Haley. And Vilda, I think. I think your best midfield three on paper, in terms of their status, their international quality, their talent, is probably Haley, Vilda, and Jackie. And obviously, that sounds harsh on Tooney, and I'm sure Tooney will play a lot this season. But you need that depth. You know, I, I looked at United's bench sometimes this season, and I thought, where are the game changers? You know, if you've got a Tooney on the bench, or you've got a Hanson on the bench, or you've got a Russo on the bench, that's what you need the end of the day you know I know players but fans want to see players play but it comes back to what I said about Chelsea you look at Chelsea's bench last season and they had Beth England on the bench and they had Erin Cuthbert on the bench and Hannah Blundell was on the bench and you need that you know you need the game changers so I think you're right I think in bigger games I think if you're playing Chelsea if you're playing Man City you might see Hayley Vilda and Jackie in there and someone like Tooney maybe on the bench in a game where you're the one in control yeah you probably don't need two defensive midfielders you know, you probably go with Vilda or Haley, and then you get Tooney in. I think the front three for me, I would have Russo, Galton, and I would have Martha up front because I just think. Oh, Leo, Hansen, like that. Because I, I don't think Kirsty Hansen's a striker, but that's the thing. Yeah, I know you can. Wait. I know you can put Kirsty on the wing, and you can put Alessia up front, and you can do that. Don't get me wrong, and that's what I mean about having options. You know, you got you can't just say, "Oh, well, that's our front three, and then we've got nothing else," because you're going to be in trouble. There'll be some games. Maybe if you're playing on the counter attack, you go with Kirsty, Leah, Alessia, because they're all incredibly pacey players on the counter attack. But if maybe it's a game you're trying to break a defense down, you're having to get crosses into the box. You know, Leah, we saw that last season. She's unbelievable at getting to the byline, getting crosses in the box. Alessia can get crosses in the box. If I was a winger crossing the ball in, would I want Kirsty Hansen in there or would I want Martha Thomas in there? I'd probably want Martha Thomas in there. She's tall. She can head a ball. It's, it's different things for different games, and that's the point. You know, you, you, you want your consistent starting 11. You want your consistent style of play, your consistent structure. For me, if I was playing against a team like Birmingham or against Aston Villa or against West Ham or against Tottenham, like last season, you saw Brighton, you know, teams that are going to come and defend... For me, you need a striker up there. Not just an attacker who can maybe play as a striker. You need a striker up there, which is what Martha is. 
if you're going to be a bit back to the wall and you're trying to play on the counter attack and you need pace, you probably go with Kirsty Hansen and you probably push Alessia through the middle or you put Ella Toon on. And that's what United need, though. They need those options and that's what they've got now. And, you know, through unforeseen circumstances last season, they didn't because Russo got injured, Tobin got injured, Kristen got injured, and they were kind of left with what they had. You know, Casey couldn't really change it game to game. Leah Galton obviously got injured as well. You know, they lost probably their first first choice four attacking players. Um, so this is the point, you know, we talk about, oh, you know, should it be Martha or Kirsty? Should it be Tooney or, or Jackie or, or Builder or Haley? It's it's whatever you need in that game. The mm. fact that you're having that conversation means United are on the right track. Because if you were looking at it going, OK, well, she plays, she plays, she plays, she plays, it's too easy, it's too predictable, you know. And I said I had that start in 11 in mind. I probably do for that first couple of games, maybe against Reading and maybe against Leicester. And then I change it against Chelsea because you are, you know, you play Chelsea, you're going to be defending a lot, whoever you are. You know, they're going to have the ball, they're going to dictate, and you're going to need something a bit different. Someone like Martha Thomas, who maybe relies on a lot of chances being created crossed into the box, you might not get that against Chelsea. So it's, um, yeah, you've got to have that flexibility. And the fact that we can talk about United's options means you're doing something right. Stuart always here. He's always wanting more. I always want more as well, Stuart. Don't worry. Yeah, I told you to tag, not me. <laughs> uh, we need. For me, you are saying... Okay, sounds like you're saying Russo on the wing. For me, Russo is our number nine. Um, I know on paper, um, the Martha Thomas has the number nine, but for me... And I'm sure other United fans, it's Russo is the number nine down the middle. I don't want to see Russo on the wing. I want to see Russo down the middle, picking up the ball, running with it. We think we saw that West Ham game when Leah whipped it in, header. You know, we saw the way she just can run with the ball. You know, she can create something out of nothing. There was a goal that's going round at the minute from training. Picked it up, turn, bang, top corner. And... I think Martha Thomas is great. We had a show on Monday. Go check it out, guys. We have three West Ham fans. They were bigging up Martha Thomas, saying she's going to score 10, 15, even reset 20 goals. And I was like, well, mate, I'll give you 50 quid if that happens. But, <laughs> you know, I, Thomas is good and I'm, I'm happy. I think she's... But I can see more Russo starting than Thomas. And maybe you think different, Rich. But I think definitely what, what Stu has said, we need wingers because all... Aaron Hansen. Yes, Tooney can go there, but I see Tooney more as a 10. Yes, uh, Fusa can go there, but more as a 10. Talk of Carrie Jones, but like I said, I see her more centrally. I'm sure they will put her out wide. But for me, and I think we need some more attacking options. I think we're, we're crying out. We're desperate, in my opinion. And, you know, we've gone from, we had, I think we lost five strikers or seven, something along those lines. We lost Jane, uh, Jess, Tobin, Kristen. And uh, LJ. So that's five people gone and we brought in one. So for me, like you said about the board, it's on the board. But talk to me about his transfer plans. Talk to me about the players that he brings in. I mean, I saw he brought in um, Amy for Orlando. Brilliant signing. But I don't know what kind of forwards he likes and what kind of wingers he might be looking at. And I'm not saying name names, but I'm just saying, were his signings good? Were they decent? Did he get the best value for money? That kind of thing. Um, from Birmingham and probably from some of his Orlando deals. I don't know what they did in the trades. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, NWSL is a different beast in terms of, like you say, the trades, the draft system, things like that. He took Taylor Korniak out of the draft um, and she was very, very good at the start of this season. You know, in that, I think in Orlando, it was so strange. And again, I think I said this the other day, obviously they have Marta and they have Alex Morgan, but they're unavailable so much, and that goes for every team in that league because they carry on playing during the international breaks, which like still staggers me to this day that they do that because you know they're playing now during the Olympics, and like teams have got you know two, three, four of their like US internationals missing. Like Orlando are now playing without Morgan and without Marta, and like that has an effect. Of course, it does. It has a massive effect, and obviously last year was so COVID influenced that they didn't even have a season. Of course, you know when people say about his record. You know, he had a season, you know, where obviously you'd adapt into the league. And then last year, 
they had nothing really. And obviously this year when they got the team together, they had Martin, they had Morgan, they were, I think, unbeaten their first six, seven games. So I think he buys players who fit his style, will fit his team. Um, it's so difficult to compare it really because again, you know, his, his budget, his expectations, you know, the players he can attract to when you're Manchester United, that just carries a different, you know, different weight to Birmingham City in terms of the players that you can sign, the players that you can attract. And so I, I find it difficult to compare what he might be able to do at Manchester United. I think from memory, you know, he signed players who had very specific roles. You know, he didn't sign players that he didn't need. Um, but I, I honestly, I don't remember him. I don't remember him tearing it up, so to speak, you know, in terms of the team, you know, Aoife Mannion and players like that, you know, they were there already. I think Ellen White went in and obviously, I mean, that was the key signing, you know, I mean, he he somewhat rejuvenated Ellen White's career, really. She'd stalled a little bit at Notts County and, you know, she wasn't always in the England team. She Well, she wasn't first choice, so to speak, and... I mean, she went to Birmingham. She was unbelievable. You know, she was the focal point of that team and obviously got the move to uh, Manchester City off the back of that. He did put a lot of faith in youth. You know, I'd say that. I remember the FA Cup final. Even though they got beat when they scored, it was Charlie Wellings and I think it was assisted by Ellie Brazil, who, who both were teenagers at the time. So, you know, he's not scared to throw them in. Um, I don't know you, Nat, like your youth team players and your devs. So, you know, you might see some of those a bit more involved in terms of his transfers. I mean, it's so difficult, you know, Orlando, the NWSL, the draft, the, the trades, it's a different world. Um, and like I said, the budget and the expectations, you know, the, the reputation of Birmingham is different to Man United. You know, Man United, you should be able to, if you have the money and you have the backing, attract, you know, so many players that you wouldn't be able to, you know, if you were at a lesser club or a club further down the table, that maybe around the world is not as well known as, as Manchester United. So I think it'd be really interesting actually to see what he does do in the WSL with a bigger team, with a bigger name, you know, with the expectation of getting Champions League football, which kind of players he will go after. Like I said, Mark's never struck me as someone who'll just sign them for the sake of it. He'll sign them if he has a role for them. Um, the one thing I always think and managers always say is they never sign players unless they're better than what you've got. So it'll be interesting. I, I, I'm more interested to see, to be honest, if they actually, if they've, you know, if he's planning to sign anyone or are they done? You know, I never read too much into Twitter accounts that much, but obviously United saw some fans in uproar that United were sort of hinting that their business was done. I haven't heard much either way, to be honest with you, but the last time I was on, I said United do things quietly and they, there you go, bam, 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 they announced five signings in the space of a week. So, um, I mean, he's got to get time to settle. I think he only arrived yesterday. I was told I've no idea whether he's got to quarantine or I have no idea what the rules are on those now. It seems to change all the time, especially coming from America. So I don't know whether he'll just be straight into training um, and see what he's got or whether it will be he can sign some of his own. The transfer window's open for another month. So I agree with you. I think they need more depth on the wings. Um, if something happened again to Leah or to Kirsty or to Alessia or whoever, then you know you're in trouble kind of straight away. You're having to put players out of position. So I'd be a little bit surprised if, if he didn't want more, whether United allow that, who knows. Um, but I, th I think he'll sign good players. I think he's, he's smart. That, that was the one thing I always got with Mark speaking to him. He was smart, like he was very thoughtful about what he was doing, very thoughtful about his tactics, very thoughtful about his system. And the reason I posted that interview and that profile was because I genuinely think, not because of my writing or anything like that, I just think it came across in the way he spoke about football and about his team and about his players that he he will not just do things for the sake of it. He has a plan. Um, not every manager should have a plan, of course, but I, he has a very specific one and that comes back to why I think you know he needs time because I, I in two three years I might look I might be back on here saying we all got it wrong um but I do think if he's backed properly and given the time I do think he will get it right at United mm. yeah I do think 
if, well, I'm sure he'll come out and say, oh, I'm happy, I'm happy, but there's no manager that would just say, yeah, that that's okay. So that, that's the end of that talk. Um, Karen here again. Do you think we have the personnel currently to play the way Mark likes? Um, yeah, I do. I, I think if you want to keep the ball, you know, playing out from the back, A, is important. And obviously one of the players back there, Aoife, was a massive part of the way his Birmingham team played. A massive part. She was so important, not just because she was a very good defender, but she was good on the ball. Um, and at the end of the day, if you want to be a possession team, your midfield is very important. And I think that is still, I thought it was last season. And I think it is this season with the addition of Vilda. I think it's the strongest part of United's team. I think Vilda is a very, very good player. Jackie, as we know, you know, is an established international star. You know, she's won the Euro. She's playing the World Cup final. I really rate Hayley Ladd. You know, I said that at the time when they signed her. I thought she'd be one of United's best signings. And not to big that opinion up, but I think she was. I think she was excellent. Um, and then you've got the depth in there as well. You've got Lucy Staniforth. You've got Ella Toon. You've got Katie Zellum. Um, you've got a couple of youngsters as well that are pushing that midfield. So I do. I, I actually do think they have the personnel um, to play the way he wants. Like you say, the question mark will be the number nine. He had Ellen White at Birmingham, you know, and as we've seen, very recently at the Olympics, you know, Ellen is capable of scoring goals all the time and the onus will be on either Martha or probably Alessia, unless someone was to come in, that those two will be the players playing that number nine role this season. Um, and will they be able to, you know, score the goals that Bunny Shaw will or Miedemar will or Sam Kerr will? And that's going to be the question mark. I think they definitely have the players. I wouldn't excuse... Poor passing or poor possession game in terms of his squad because I think the players are there. I, I do. I think you have a midfield with Haley, Vilda, Jackie. You should be able to get on top of most games. Um, I think the question again will be because I think the defence has improved as well. I think Eva's a really good signing. I know some people questioned it. I think she's a great defender. And I like Hannah Blundell. Um, I do like Hannah Blundell. And I think Bagley will push Mary Earps as well. I really think she'll push Mary Earps. I think the question mark is still up the other end of the pitch but the longer that you know if Leah's fit I mean Leah was unbelievable the first half of last season if she's fit and she's at that level you know because she scored a lot of goals as well as creating them Alessia will keep getting better and better you know I've raved about Alessia Russo for about five six years now since she was about 16 so um all the potentials there is the depth there in all the positions compared to some of the other teams maybe not just yet but and, yeah, I think, like I said, the question mark will be, mm -hmm. will they score, especially in the big games when you come up against the top teams and the Magda Eriksons and the Leah Williamsons and the Steph Hortons, etc., will Russo and Martha Thomas be able to cut it? And I think that's so probably the big question mark at the moment for me. For me, I think, yeah, like you said, Russo, I even would put Hanson, Russo, Hanson, like I said, I said my front three, Russo, Hanson and... Leah, keep those fit throughout the whole season, but that's a big if, so you're just relying all on that, and then you know you know, you know, can't do it for a whole season and all the competitions, so I think it's criminal and that might be strong words, but I think if he just goes in like that we've got fun, even if it's just one more player a wait, someone who can play across all positions um, but yeah we'll have to wait and see, Craig is shouting out that he made uh, Jane Moore, really good signing Um. People are now talking about Rachel Daly, uh, more signings. But I want to go back to where I said we were going to go, Orlando. Obviously, he came in in Orlando. He was flying high at Birmingham. Came in at Orlando. Yes, COVID happened. But I think someone told me it was about 14 defeats in a row or something like that. Yes, COVID happened. No one's denying that COVID. COVID has messed up our season just gone just because of Christmas. And we've had to move to training ground. Talk about no toilets, no showers. So listen, but to say 14 games or 11 games or however many games, that's not good enough. That's unacceptable. The end. There's no, for me, I see people saying, oh, well, this, oh, well, Alex Moore, oh, well. Don't make excuses for a win percentage of 34% because there's no excuse to be had. It's not good enough, period. 
And that's why Orlando fans are celebrating that he's gone because they think he's no good. Uh, arrogant. I mean, I've spoken to people who watched NWSL. They're saying you might have a style of playing, but if you ain't got the players to play it, but he does at United, so that's probably a tip. But if you ain't got players to sort of control the midfield, why are you trying to play like that? Why why are you not a good enough coach you can do different things or, you know, try out different ways? Or, you know, if Alex Morgan's only turns up before the Olympics, why not do something different with her? Why not try and get the best out of her? We see with Ollie gets the best out of Pogba, Jose couldn't. So now even all the girls are coming out and sort of slagging him off and, and I get why they're doing it. I would do it too. I'd be all behind it. Oh, we feel the best that we've ever felt. This is, you know, all that kind of swagger. And fair play to them. I think go for it. Of course, slag him off. But, you know, maybe there is some truth in it because if he was so great man manager, you wouldn't have left them in the lurch like that. Obviously, it's Man United, so they, they probably won't eventually begrudge him. But, you know, you could have let people know, let your captain know. And what's your take then? Just go straight to, to Orlando, start, tell me about it. Like I said, 34%, you can dress it up, but it's not good enough. Tell, talk to me, Rich. We've left me a lot to unpack there. Um, as you were talking, I was trying to think of all the various different things you said. I think it's interesting, first, what you said about the player reaction. Um, from what I actually gathered, he was quite liked. I think the players liked him in Orlando from things I've heard over there. I think the emotion, uh, I saw Sidney LaRue's interview was more that he had left. You know, he'd gone, you know, as a bit of a surprise halfway through a season when certainly at the start of the season, they'd been in their best period whilst he was there. And I think there were very mitigating circumstances and whether Mark will say this in his, you know, when he starts doing his media over here, I don't know. I do think family was a big part of it. Um, I don't think that Laura and his kid could get a visa to go over there permanently. And obviously with COVID, I mean, look, when he went over there, you know, nobody could have foreseen that that was going to happen. Um, and, you know, his kid's been growing up over here, you know, with his partner and, you know, with the pandemic, he's not been able to see them and they've not been able to go over there regularly. I think anybody in the world would have the empathy enough to understand that someone would want to go home to a job to be with their family. And I do understand that was a big part of it. I do also understand the Man United, but I think this has been out there already, but the Man United players are very happy um, with the appointment. I think in terms of... His results, yes, it was. I think the first season was was poor, and I think you're right in terms of. Yes, you can say there was no Marta. I think Marta played, I think probably about half the games first season. I don't even think Morgan played that. I think Morgan played about four or five. I think in that first season, in what is a 24 game season, um, so you do have to adapt. But I can also understand the manager going over there saying, well, look, this is my style of play. This is how I want to play. We're going to have to stick with this. And I think there's that lack of peril in the NWSL as well because you don't get relegated. So if you are bottom of the league, if you're losing every game, it doesn't actually really mean anything. You can't get relegated. So I think if you looked at the Orlando Pride stats for that first season, I think the players near the top of the list of appearances would have been you know, college kids, draftees, squad players i think i think even alana kennedy when she was there didn't play a lot you know ashlyn harris ali krieger i don't think they played a lot because it was the world cup year um a lot of them were with the u.s team marta was obviously with brazil i think zadorsky was with canada uh you know kennedy would have been with australia so they had a very almost a backup squad and then obviously last year was just uh it was just a write-off Obviously, they had the Challenge Cup. They had the uh, the Spring Series, not the Spring Series, the Fall Series after that. Um, so it's it's really difficult to judge. I do agree that there's an argument that yeah, if you don't have your players available, you have to adapt. But I can see it from a coach's side of saying, well, look, this is if I'm here for two, three, four years, this is how we're going to be playing. So we might as well get used to it. You know, even if it's costing us now. There's no point changing it, you know, if in two, three years we're going to have to get used to it again anyway. You know, we have to do it now and make the best of it with the players we have. Um, I'd be interested, actually, now that you mentioned it, to go back and look how which players did actually make the most appearances 
in that first season in 2019 because I would wager a lot of the key players were a long way down the list. And again, that is one of the quirks of the NWSL that even when there's a World Cup, they just carry on. You know, can you imagine in the, you know, I'm sure Gareth Taylor would be getting a lot of stick if Manchester City were having to play now because he's got 12 Team GB players or something um, at the Olympics. So obviously that's going to affect your results. But, you you know, they did struggle to adapt. There's no doubt about that. And I think there was a, a little bit of naivety, some of the things he went over. He was very, I mean, you'll love his interviews. He was incredibly open in saying, you know, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do it my way, you know, because it's become cliched, but it is a very transitional league. It's not a possession-based league. It's very athletic. It's very counter-attacking. And it's part of the reason I'll be interested to see how Casey does over there because she's very similar, you know, and she's, I think she said it on one of the BBC uh, broadcasts she was on uh, for the, the warm-up game saying that she, you know, wanted to play possession football. And that is very rare in NWSL. You know, teams don't play possession football um but wsl teams do and that's why i think mark is a lot more suited to this league it'd be interesting if he ever went back to see if he adapted differently but oh, there's so many question marks of course there are about his time in orlando particularly that first season that was always going to take time to adapt especially when you've got players missing so there's mitigating circumstances but there's also things i definitely think he could have done better like i said last season well, last year, because there wasn't a season, was a complete write-off. And then I don't think it's any coincidence, you know, the start of uh, this season when he had Morgan, you know, back from obviously she was pregnant and then obviously went to Tottenham for a bit and he had Marta and, you know, he had Sydney LaRue back as well. You know, she had a lot of time off, you know, uh, through pregnancy as well. So, you know, Ashlyn Harris come back in form and, you know, he got Taylor Korniak in. It was massive for them. Um, first half of the season, brought in Ali Riley, obviously then brought in obviously Amy, like you said, right at the end, just before he left. So the team changed a lot. You know, he, mold, he started to mould his team together and, and the results did start to come. And yeah, there's so many. It's such a stretch. It's, I don't think there's a different league in the world. You know, I think you look at England, France, Spain, different teams, different players, but... The styles aren't that different in terms of the way teams want to play. The NWSL, it's it's a great league to watch. I love watching it because every game's close. Every game's 3-2, 4-3, 2-1, 2-2. You know, teams just attack. You know, they counter-attack each other. They go at it. You know, it's athletic. It's There's pace. There's power. It's a great league to watch. But it's just not a possession league. It's just not. It, it, it doesn't really work. It's not ever been massively successful there and it was it was an interesting challenge for him I think I said it at the time you know going over there to take that challenge on and like I said I'm sat here now thinking the exact same about Casey you know because I think if Casey goes over there and starts trying to play possession football it's going to take a bit of time um, to get used to what she has in her advantage obviously is she's building a team from scratch so she can buy or bring in possession players. Mark obviously had what he had with Orlando. So, yeah, there are there are mitigating circumstances. You know, that's not me sat here defending him. There just are mitigating circumstances. But I do think you're right in terms of... I think there was potentially some naivety in that he could just go over there and kind of rip up the rule book and do it his way and, and be successful. Maybe that comes from being a young manager. Um, but, yeah, I think definitely the first season there had to be... With the World Cup, knowing that he was going to lose so many of his key players, there had to be a little bit of give and take, and there probably there probably just wasn't enough of that. And I think he probably learned from that, but obviously we never saw that last year. We ne- we never know because the season got cancelled. But you know, the basis of the first half of this season showed that potentially he did sort of learn that there was probably a, a balancing act in terms of the way to play. Yeah, but then you can say that, but then obviously he started well with Alex Morgan, started well with Marta, and then obviously now they've gone off to the Olympics, and yeah, he's just left, but they did then start to to slip down the, the league. Um, so you could say potentially they haven't learned. I know this is sort of me being harsh, or, but I am just trying to play that devil's advocate because for me, I think if he's coming into United, yeah, he has got time, and yeah, they will probably back him, but, you know... Like you said, there's a bit more p- 
peril like he's uh just from listening to you you know yeah you could probably got a time in orlando but i do think in man united you ain't got time like i said you've got to win um i mean a journalist actually spoke to me about this and said this is going to be probably his first club where is the, the expectations are on him i'm not saying that you don't expect from um birmingham currency they were they were winning a lot and you know then obviously as he started to win more you know that grew um and then but orlando i mean people what people have told me they're not great anyway potentially so it's it's sort of probably this is where they're always going to be they're never sort of going to be like portland and winning it or nc or throw loads of money into it so it's sort of he's been at sort of and i don't mean to be disrespectful like mid-table clubs this is an next club where you know, the badge is so heavy, um, people are going to expect everything. I was even saying about Martha Thomas, people will, will tune in, look at her, see that she's wearing nine, see that she's wearing Man United, and if she's not scoring goals, they're going to say, who, who are you? Go, you know, it's not good enough. And that sounds horrible because she might have made two or three assists in that game, but it doesn't matter because you're the number nine and people are expecting you to score goals. So people are going to be tuning in and watching Man United versus Reading expecting them to win. Because it's Man United, and I'm not. I don't think he's a. Well, I don't know. You know him better than me, Rich and Craig, and everyone in the comments. But no one sort of like you said with Orlando probably had that bit of time. Whereas now it's sort of everyone's expecting big, big things, and you have a sink or swim. And I think Casey probably didn't even expect the expectations that that came with the fan base, that came with the club, that came with the shirt. Um you know yeah they messed up in the end but even she was saying stuff like oh I failed and you know this is what we expect and i never knew the fans would be so not harsh but so roaring that you know we we went and lost in a friendly and people were booting off you know so but that's because everywhere you go people want to beat you everywhere you, you are they want to win they will put up 110 percent against you more than they will you know, that that second win comes out when Man United come to town, you know, everyone's ready. You'll know it, Rich. So, you know, do you think he's ready for something like that? Well, again, you give me a lot to unpack. Um, you gave me a lot to. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think, just going to what a few people in the comments said about Alex Morgan and LaRue and whatnot, Morgan was bad at club level for a long time, I completely admit. I think she did score four goals in the first four or five games this season. She was massive for them at the start of the season before um, she went off on international break. And as uh, Craig and one or two others said, Sydney was pregnant the whole 2019 season. And then last year they didn't even put, they didn't play the challenge cup because of COVID and they had COVID outbreaks and whatnot. I think in terms of his, the mental side of it, like you say, with Man United fans, it's funny because he got quite accused when he first went to America that, he was quite arrogant. Um, I don't think he is, knowing him as... I don't think he's an arrogant... He's confident, I think, in his own ability. I don't think he's arrogant. But he did go over there, you know, and he started saying, you know, I, you know I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, we're going to play my way. And American fans were like, whoa, 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 this, like, this British guy's coming over, like, never managed mm -hmm. in this league, you know, saying all these things. And But to me, that shows there is a mental resilience there. I think, actually, United fans would like that. You know, if he comes over here and says... Yeah, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it my way, you know, we're going to play this kind of... And that's what you want to hear. You want to hear someone who... There's a line, there is a there is a very thin line between being assured and being arrogant. And I don't think Mark is arrogant, but he's very assured of, of what he does. Um, and I think that's what United fans need. I think as well when it does actually start, and, you know, hopefully with fans back in stadiums and things this season... I think you'll take him very quickly. I think, I'm sure you've seen, or some United fans will have seen, the videos of him marching through the streets on the way to Orlando games with the flares and wearing the scarf and things like that. I mean, you don't see... I can't remember seeing any other manager in women's football that marched to a game with a set of supporters. Whether I can see that in Lee Sports Village, I'm not sure. It's a different kind of environment to Orlando. But um, I think... I think he says and does all the right things. I don't think the mental side of it from knowing him, I don't think he'll be too bothered because I think he, he trusts himself. Um, as someone else has just said, yeah, he talked about creating art. It is a little bit of a weird way of talking about when it's football, but that's just the way Mark is. Like He's very... 
it's, it's difficult sometimes because I've done it. You know, you write things, you say things, and people that don't know you, they take it out of context a little bit. You know, the Americans didn't know Mark. He was just this guy from Birmingham, turned up to their league. No one really knew who he was. But for me knowing him or for the Birmingham fans knowing him, saying you're going to create art's not an arrogance. It's just the way he is. It's just the way he says things. Um, and it probably wasn't the wisest thing. I think if I was his PR advisor, I might have told him to tone the language down a little bit going over there for the first time. But I think he trusts himself. He backs himself. Um, how he'd react if he starts getting booed in the stadium and, you know, abused on social media, I don't know. I think that did happen quite a bit at Birmingham in the early days um, from one or two fans. And it certainly happened at Orlando. So, you know, it's, it's probably something he's got used to. You gain that resilience. I think that's the same with anybody. You know, when I first started writing about women's football 10 years ago and you get abused, you know, it's hard to deal with. 10 years on now, I just sort of brush it off because you get older and you get more experience. I think that's the same in any single job. I'm sure it's the same for you, Nat, in your job that you start to brush it off the more that you get used to it. So, but every time I, I spoke to him, I always saw a manager and a coach that trusted in what he did. And I think that's the biggest thing. The other biggest thing is, of course, you've got to get your players to trust in that. And he does have those few players there that, that really know him and I'm sure they'll be telling the other players about him and what he's going to do and what he's going to be like. So I think what this has made me realise now, to be fair, is it's a big step into the unknown because he's still a very young manager. The first time Mark became a manager was four years ago and he's been, you know, in a lot through that, you know, in terms of Birmingham, FA Cup finals, you know, leaving to go to Orlando, then the COVID period. But he's only been a manager for four years. It feels like a lot longer, I have to be honest, now that I just said that. But it is only four years. You know, he's, he's only been a manager a year longer than Casey. You know, so the Birmingham thing, it's so hard to relate to Manchester United because it's such a, it's a different ball game. And that's not to disrespect Birmingham. They were a very good team at the time. But the brand, the expectation, like you said, the players that they could attract, Orlando was just, again, a very different ball game different team, different style, losing a whole season to COVID. I think now is the opportunity everyone will get to see where Mark's potential is. Is he going to, like you said, sink or swim? Is he going to become a very good coach? Because I think this is the first time, hopefully now, fingers crossed, COVID behind us and all that, you know, we can get a proper season going and have fans back in stadiums and not have interruptions and postponements and things like that. That way you've got a good team, good foundation, budget, international players, where they're not going to disappear, you know, for half the season to a World Cup or a, a CONCACAF tournament like happens in America, you'll get the answers now, you know, because I think, like I said, he's still so early in his coaching career. It's a big job, but I know people say that Man United took their time and things like that, but I'm sure it was a very diligent process um, to find their manager and... I'm sure they spoke to people, players, coaches, you know, whatever about Mark. You know, any club would do that, let alone a club like Manchester United. So, I think the fact they've appointed him says a lot. It says a lot about his coaching ability. Um, but this is going to be the opportunity now to really see it because I think there were mitigating circumstances. This is a step up from Birmingham. If he was going straight from Birmingham to Man United and you took Orlando out of it, you'd be saying it's a step up. It's a tougher task. You throw Orlando in and everything that happened over there. I think it's 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 going to be so interesting. I, you know, you get that split opinion now because it's hard to judge. It's hard to judge Birmingham compared to Man United. It's almost impossible to compare Orlando Pride compared to Manchester United in completely different leagues. And you have that split now. I've seen people on Twitter saying great appointment. You know, really looking forward to seeing how he does. And I've seen the fans. Some people saying Skinner out before he's even turned up in the country. So, I think my view is, and I'll stand by it, whatever happens, I think it'll be a really good appointment. I really do. Other people don't. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I think the interesting, you know, maybe a lot of Man United fans maybe didn't see him at Birmingham, you know, because as, as he left, United were coming in. And, you know, with that, a lot of new fans, I'm not saying all, I'm sure there's a lot of Man United fans that did watch women's football uh, when Mark was at Birmingham. But maybe some have only seen Orlando. Maybe some are only aware of Orlando. And 
stats at Birmingham don't tell the whole story. You know, you're not expected to have a humongous win percentage and be bringing home trophies and things like that. I think he got the best out of Birmingham for me to have them fourth in the league, FA Cup final. I don't think you can do any more. You know, obviously, like, I know Wardy very well, obviously, and, you know, I've worked with her. I saw some Man United fans saying they wanted Wardy, and I think, well, Mark did a lot. And again, different circumstances. He had, a, he had a better team than Wardy, absolutely no doubt. But, you know, he got them to an FA Cup final. They were challenging the, the big teams. And, you know, last season it was very difficult for Birmingham. And, and that's not mm -hmm. to say Wardy's not a good coach. But I did find it interesting to see some people said, you know, we'd take Wardy off the back of last season when, you know, Mark's track record for me is better than that. And there were some that said they didn't want him. So it's in, it's an interesting perception. And, the you know, we'll sit here in 12 months yeah, or two yeah. years or whatever. and and Six months we'll have you back on, don't worry, Richard. One, <laughs> one of us will be right and one of us will be wrong. What I will say is if he comes in and says he's going to make up, I'm all for it, I'm all for everything, you can have everything. I'll get you a badge now, I'll get you a T-shirt, I'll get you everything, yeah? That's not a problem. The problem will be is don't come and say something and don't deliver. Man United fans keep receipts. So everything that Casey has said, five-year process... We were saying, well, if it's five years, you need to get Champions League this year. She didn't forgot that we knew that. Crawl one rock, all this stuff, we remember everything. And what I will say about Man United fans, there's fans that, yeah, haven't watched it when thing is. I sort of remember him. So I remember that last few games. I remember Ellen White scoring that goal at, at Kings Meadow. I remember all the way Birmingham were. I remember Birmingham being fourth. Ladinator, just before he signed her. You know, I remember all of that. Yeah, I didn't, didn't watch it the year before, but what I will say about my year, they do the research. So I've come and I've done a bit of research on him, on his time in Orlando, on his time in Birmingham. Um, so, you know, people, there's some fans are saying, oh, well, you don't know anything. No, no, no. Man United fans do research on a lot of things and they'll go and they'll ask you, Rich, and I'm sure you see, had United, well, I'm in your DMs, you know, so I'm sure lots of United fans are always asking lots of questions and that's the way, to be honest, I want it to stay because... That's the only way anyone learns by asking questions. What happened this? What happened that? So that's why obviously we're doing this video. Um, I see Amy saying, do we know? what?" As far as I know, and Rich can tell me if I'm wrong, there was sort of like a shortlist. And then Mark was on the second shortlist with another manager. And that other manager I might have wanted. But what I will say is, regardless of whoever was on the list, Mark's the guy now. The only other thing that I do see people saying and I'm going to wrap it up because I'm going for a bit, but I just I do think this point is important. Man United had Casey. Casey was like our oh, girl, the focal point of English football. You know, it's Man United women, and she's the one guiding it. She's got little kids, and she and you know I used to hate it when they used, to, but it does. It makes a difference in my opinion, and I know a lot of people are upset. That Man United women's team has now got a man manager. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a man manager, but you know, women's football, you do want to see more women given a chance. That's why, in a way, I do think uh, Wardy and Skinner is the same because when I look at Wardy, and I'm going back to Sheffield days now, I think the way she makes you feel, and I'm just a fan, I was never interested in anything, but the way she, I don't know, it's the aura, it's the the, the thing about it, she cares about her players and that reminds me of Casey. But I think she's better in the, well, in what she's done at Birmingham and now what she's doing at Villa. For me, I think potentially her transfer dealings would be better than, than Casey if she got a bit more money. Um, Wardy, yeah, she makes mistakes. She made mistakes at Sheffield. She made mistakes at Birmingham. But then what is he just gone and done the whole season at Orlando, you know, before COVID? So, I, I am a bit disappointed that, yeah, and I do understand why people are disappointed it's not a woman because I do think those things are important. I'm not saying that it can't be a man. Of course, I'm going to get behind him. But for me, I do think a Wardy would have been good. A name that I put up before, Maria Pry, what she did at Levante, very, very, you know, good. Um, basically, they were second. I know Real Madrid finished second. But to go against Real Madrid and get to the final of the cup and, you know, only lose by a small margin against Barcelona... Great. I think Rhea um, Goyal, I don't, can't say her name, but the Juventus coach, what she did at Juventus, where she built that team up, etc., etc. Those women, for me, and then I look at Mark Skinner, and yeah, I don't know everything, but I do think there are better options than Mark Skinner. I'm fully behind him, but 
I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, he's the best guy. He's the number one manager. Maybe when he starts winning and we're, we play City, yeah, I'll come out, I'll come to you, Rich, and I'll say, oh, he's the best thing since sliced bread. But at the minute, looking objectively, there's there's better people there and there's, there's the women manager who would have been fantastic. What's your views just on that before we go, Rich? Um, I think... I mean, obviously, you say about Wardy being passionate and whatnot. Like I say, I think if there's any manager that will get the fans passionate, it will be Mark. Um, I think he's got that. If there's, uh, to be fair, if there's one manager I could imagine what Mark did in Orlando in terms of the marching down the the road with the fans and having the flares and the scarves and whatnot. It's probably Wardy, to be fair. Um, but I think Mark will really. I think you know. I saw you touch the badge. You know when you said about Wardy. I think Mark will get that. I really do. I think he's got that passion wherever he goes. In terms of the wider point, it's a difficult one. I mean, I've always come from the the side of things that it's the best person, whoever, you know, and football clubs definitely come from that because they want to win. You know, winning makes you money at the end of the day and that's what football clubs are about. So they want the best person. For me, if the best person's a male, it's a male. If the best person's a female, it's a female you know, either way. And I get it. I mean, I, I'm always wary of, and I think we've seen it sometimes for me in the England youth teams as well, but I think even in women's football domestically, maybe sometimes women pushed into jobs, maybe too early, maybe jobs that they weren't ready for. And to be honest, I've seen it with men as well. Um, so that's kind of what, I don't think people should ever be putting jobs unfairly based on who they are or what their gender is either way. I think it should be if the best person for this job is a female, hire the female. If the best person for the job is a male, hire the male. Um, maybe that's a bit old-fashioned. Maybe I get shot down for it. I don't know. But, um, you know, if they deem that Mark is the best person for the job, then he shouldn't not get it because he's a man, you know, and someone else maybe inferior shouldn't get it because they're a female. If there was a female involved in the hiring process who was better than Mark, she should get the job, you know, and obviously you mentioned Rita and Maria and whatnot. Obviously Maria's gone off to, is it Chile? I think now she's managing down there. Rita's still in Italy with Inter. But yeah, it's, it's difficult getting foreign managers over here. There's not been many, um, you know, Pedro Losa obviously has gone to Scotland. He was here, but outside of that, you know, a lot of British coaches, you know, Australian, things like that. You're not seeing many from Spain or, or Italy or, France or things like that. There's the language barriers, and I don't think Maria. I, I spoke to Rita once or twice before. She does speak a little bit of English. I'm not sure. I don't think Maria speaks any, um, if a little bit. And that that you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's difficult when you've got a, a largely British speaking team and your manager doesn't speak any English. Um, it's not ideal. So. Yeah, there's all kinds of factors. I get people saying they want a, a female coach. I do understand that. But I think anybody, you know, you're hiring anybody um, if at any job in the world, whether it's in football or whether it's in my job, you know, at a newspaper or a magazine. There's a lot of women's journalists now, a lot of female journalists, and they're getting jobs because they're good. Um, for me, it's, any any business owner, any chairman of any company in the world, they want the best person the best person is going to get the best results and the best results gets you trophies and it gets you money and that's what clubs want so for me that's how it should always be if it's a female great if it's a male it's a male just the one quick question from craig do you know if that affects it mitch foreign managers brexit i'm not sure i haven't heard any i can't imagine it would because the the player rulings are based around very specific things like international caps now and things like that and obviously that doesn't apply to managers they don't have caps or anything like that so um i don't think so i mean they'd still have to obviously depending on where they're coming from now have visas and things like that you know obviously beforehand you didn't need a visa obviously for me you countries and and things so uh potentially it's a little bit more difficult i don't think i don't think it affects things as much as it would with players i think with players particularly younger players now, you know, I saw people talking about obviously Barbara Banda um, during the Olympics. I don't see any way she could potentially come to England at the minute with the rules. Um, I don't think it'd be the same. Space. I don't think it'd be the same for managers. Mm. There's a player, I don't know if you know her, 
Rich, and I'm going to wrap it up. I am, I am promise. Um, Hayley Bajega, she's from Malta. She's mm. 18, and she's a quality player. If anyone's ever seen, I don't know what team it is if they're playing green in Italy. Do you think that would affect someone like that, getting someone like that? She, I'd say she's better than on the even Navarro level. I think she would come straight over because she's Spanish national team. But, you know, from what I've seen of her, she's really good player. Or Hannah Benison. From Sweden, you think that would affect? But I suppose she's playing for Sweden. Yeah, I, I think I think Benison would be okay um, because of the league she's playing in, the fact that she's a national team player, and she will have played a certain percentage of their games. With Haley, she's playing for a team that's well down the rankings. Um, she's in a decent league, but it's not completely fully professional, and obviously she's not in one of the top teams either. She's not at Juventus or. AC or Inter or anything like that. I, I'd have to check the rules. I'd have to go through them all. I don't think Haley would okay. be able to come to the WSL um, at enough. the minute. I agree. I, I, I never saw the need for it, but obviously Brexit has made things very complicated. I think it's it's daft to turn away, you know, best foreign players who can come to England. I've never bought into it, and I've had this conversation God knows how many times on social media, that it's to the detriment of our young players. I think if you are good enough, you will play, and if you're not as good as the foreign player, well, that's your challenge. You know, if, if an Ella Toon or a Lauren Hemp or Chloe Kelly or Lotta Wubbermoy, if they're not as good as the foreign player, then, you know, you've got to improve. You need testing, and I think actually players, players like Lauren Hemp will become better playing with players like Khadija Shaw. You know, players like Wubben Moy will become better playing with players like Frieda Maynham and, you know, the Chelsea youngsters playing with the players they do, you know, Harder and, and Sam Kerr. And, you know, I think you look at the England team at the minute, the young players coming through, the Hemps, the Kellys, the Toons, the, the Millie Turners, the Wubben Moys, whoever, the Russos, they're all playing. You know, they're, they're not, they're in the team because they're good enough. Um and I don't think the the influx of foreign players has affected that. If you're good enough, you will play. And if you're not good enough, then you're not going to be in the question for England anyway. So, you know, for Hayley Bejega or Barbara Banda, whoever, even Navarro came over here, if they're better than the English players, then those players aren't going to play for England anyway. You know, that's as simple as that. And if they're not as good, then they're the players that will go on and play for England. So I, I, I've, never, I've never bought into it that it has an effect on the England team, there's a lot of other factors that have more of an effect on how England perform than that. I think right now, this moment in time, I don't think there's ever been as much good English talent coming through. I think you look at the exciting young players and you look up, obviously, even further down now, the ones that are knocking on the door, the LJs, the Ebony Salmons, the Jess Parks, you know, some of the ones you would have gone and seen in in the 19s um, last week. There's some very, very talented players um and they'll play because they're good enough you know and they're the ones that will play for england and if you're not playing for england it's not because of other people it's because you're not good enough so the fact that we can't attract those top young foreign players now maybe from less established countries i.e malta and zambia is a shame in my opinion because i want to see the best young players come over i don't want to see them go elsewhere yeah no i agree and um you know, talking of young 19-year-olds, I know where uh, Rich will say Lucy Watson, but obviously our uh, Annie Hutchinson just joined, made the winning team today. So what can you, what can you say? Um, thank you, Rich, so much. I know we've been going on 20 minutes more than probably what I should, but it doesn't matter because I think we've said what we need to say. I think all the questions, well, I feel like I've just been asking you a lot of questions. You've obviously been answering, so I'm really grateful. I'm sure everyone who's, who's watched is grateful. Um, I want to remind everyone tomorrow it's me and John again, and we've got Catherine Bat 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 Battle, or I can't even, I don't know, Bait or something like that. She writes for the Daily Mail, she works for other places. She's the one who first linked Karen uh, Simon to us, the Australian. So we'll talk a bit about that. Is that a player that United are going to look at? Is that a player that Mark likes? Uh, where does she see United going now? Uh, Craig's just shouting you out. Thanks for coming on. No, really. We do appreciate it. Drop a like on here. Obviously, we've been nominated for the FSA's FCA 
I don't even know if I said it right, but just, you know, it's on our pin post. Check that out. Retweet that. If you like this content, tell us what you want to see. Sure, Rich will come on again during the season. Rich, is there anything you want to say? Where anyone can find you or shout anything out? No, I think if anybody wants to follow me, man, now they probably do. But, um, yeah, just thanks for having me on, Nat. I'm always happy to come on and, and chat. So, it's uh, I don't mind running over time a little bit. It's okay. Um, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for shouting out to Lucy as well. Yeah, it's okay. I right, shout yeah. out to everyone and Courtney, Courtney, Sue, and Kurt. Go check her out. Go check out Sheffield if they're the your way. Oh, she's, but, she's way. She's way past the under 19s now. Yeah, yeah. But listen, guys, thank you. Yeah, tune in tomorrow and then obviously throughout the week. Thanks, Rich. See you later, guys. No worries. Thanks, mate.